Good morning, everyone. Leaving on a jet plane. Um, I don't know if, how many of you are old enough to remember that. That was, um, that was a song that was out in 1969. And it coincides with the time that I was a kid at school, and we did a project on the new London airport. And I remember there, there were three, three names that came come back to me. Dungeness, Foulness, and Maplin Sands. That's what we were talking about then, about a new London airport. Wind the clock forward 45 years, and we're still talking about it. So why don't we just get on and do it? Well, I think the answer to that is, it's not easy. It's difficult. There aren't actually any easy solutions. I'm going to talk today about those solutions that are currently on the table. This is a great quote. Now, I'm not suggesting what you've read and what you've heard are lies or damn lies, but my goodness me, there's a lot of statistics out there. I could have come here today with a pile of papers like that. Facts and figures, many of which contradict each other, and the interpretation of them is all different. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that, that we keep flying. We keep traveling. And there is a finite amount of air capacity or runway capacity in the UK, even more acute in the southeast. Now, all the facts and figures you're going to hear today are approximate. I'm not trying to, uh, then we'll start trading facts that this is right, this is wrong. All right, they're all approximate. They're in the right sort of ballpark. I want to get across some, some concepts of what the issues are. So that's issue number one. We keep on traveling, and very soon we're going to be completely out of runway capacity, particularly in the southeast of England. The government set up an airport commission to try and decide which were the best options that we had. What was the problem? What were the best options? And these are the main players. You've got Boris, obviously, Boris Island, Estuary Terminal. John Holland Kay, Heathrow. Charlie Cornish, Stansted. Stuart Wingate, Gatwick. And the poor guy at the end, Sir Howard Davis, was the guy in charge of the commission who had to listen to it all, filter it all, and come up with his idea of what was the best answer. He happens to have come up with a unanimous decision it should be Heathrow. That doesn't mean to say it will be Heathrow, because that's just a technical analysis. Now the ball gets passed to politicians. And that's where it's all likely to get all very sticky. <laughs> These guys are mostly interested in getting re-elected next time round. And their decisions are going to be highly, highly swayed by what they think might get them re-elected. They're not here to make difficult decisions. Probably the biggest risk is they're going to go, oh, it's all too difficult. They'll kick it in the long grass. But today, I want to talk about some other issues, away from the immediate headlines. Some of those things you've read, which um, don't necessarily all tie up. And particularly, I want to talk about you. These airports, these planes, are for you. Not you as corporate representatives, but as you, personal people with friends and family. That's why I'm dressed like, I don't normally dress like this in the office. I'm dressed like this to make a point. This is not about me, Arab. This is about me, Richard Matthews, and what I want to do, where I want to travel. And it applies to you too. These aeroplanes are for you. So what sort of traveller are you? I'm going to take two extremes. All right? And okay, this is one extreme. Mr. Business Traveller. Okay? He's characterised by he's money rich, he's time poor. He's interested in getting places quickly. 
And actually, the cost is not that important. The other side, the other extreme, is this. These are, these are the backpackers. Okay? Time rich, money poor. Okay? If it's cheap, they'll do it. It doesn't matter if it takes a bit longer. Now, you, as personal travelers, will sit somewhere between those two extremes. And if you're anything like me, you'll find that you swing from one side to the other. When I'm traveling on business, I'm definitely more in the time's important. I just need to get there, and I need to get home. And if it costs a bit more, so be it. But when I travel on holiday, when I travel with my friends, my family, I'm much more like these guys. I'm not quite as extreme as these guys. I don't have all the time in the world, but I'm much more. Okay. Now, you will all fit into this somewhere. Now, remember, that these planes are for you. What is it you need? We talk a lot about solutions, but we don't necessarily talk about what the problem is. You're the problem. What do you need? So, we help you along the way. If travel were faster, but more expensive, would you travel more? Well, the businessman would. That would be great. He could get to more places more quickly. But the backpacker, certainly not. If tickets were free, would you travel more? Well, the businessman wouldn't. He's short of time. Money wasn't really the issue. Backpacker, oh, yes. Oh, I'll travel more. Do right, I would. Which leads us on to the next thing, which is seat pricing. Because if your travel demands are price sensitive, seat pricing is a very important thing to understand. How is it that seats cost what they do? This is a plan of a big aircraft. This is the sort of aircraft that British Airways fly over to the United States. And it's divided up. First class at the front, business class, premium, and economy at the back. You'll usually find me at the back. Now, the interesting thing is, there are 14 seats at first class, 28 in business, 40 in premium economy, and 117 in economy. And you probably think, well, the airlines are only interested in these because the tickets are much more expensive up here. Do you know how much the seat prices are? It, it pretty much doubles. Return flight to, to New York, 600 quid, 1,200 quid, 2,400 quid, 4,800 pounds. So who are the important travelers? Ones at the front, obviously. Hmm, I want to question that. If you actually add up all the number of seats in this half of the aircraft and you multiply it by the ticket price, you come to exactly the same amount of income as you get from the back end of the aircraft. Pretty much 50-50. So just because you're traveling economy or premium economy, don't think you're not important. You're very important. And why are you important? Lovely quote from Richard Branson. If you want to be a millionaire, start with a billion dollars and launch a new airline. <laughs> it's not about, he's not making a lot of money out of it. He's, cl he's clearly got some other things that he's interested in, but it's not the money. It's the prestige, I would suggest. That owning an airline isn't about making lots of money. It's about prestige. It's about national prestige. It's about personal prestige. So that sure, he's got an awful lot more publicity out of owning an airline <laughs> than he ever did out of owning a record company. How much profit? If you're optimistic, 3%. Ryanair, hugely successful year last year. Profitable airline, isn't it? If you look at the headlines, they, their turnover has gone up dramatically. Their profits have almost doubled. Do you know what their profits were the year before? 2.4%. What were they last year? 4%. British Airways, AIG Group, less than 1%. Okay, so this is serious, all right? And the reason it's serious is because to make that profit, those airlines have got to fill the seats. All of the seats. And that's where you come in, okay? They've got to fill the seats. They don't have to have many spare seats that wipes out that profit. And that's important in this whole debate about airports and airlines. Passenger profiles, it's not just that all business people sit up the front and all 
tourists sit at the back. But what is important <laughs> is how many of each. And I know there's an awful lot of talk about, you know, airport expansion, good for business, good for business, good for business. What does it mean for you? Well, even at somewhere like Heathrow, which has got an awful lot of business travel, the ratio is something like 70% leisure and 30% business. The other bit that's in there is connecting passengers, and they can be either leisure or, or business. I want to come on to the importance of connecting passengers, because you hear a lot about that. Hub mania. You've heard a lot about airport hubs. The importance of airport hubs. What, so what, what is important about airport hubs? What is it that makes such a difference? Well, I'll give you a little, little thing, OK? We've got five, five islands here, OK? And for the sake of this little story, those islands are 100 miles apart. Right? There are four people on each of the islands. Now, this is scalable. It could be 1,000 miles apart. It could be 400, 4,000 people. But just for the sake of this, there's four people on each of the islands. And the four people on this island here want to get to each of the other islands. So they fly. OK? So that's four aircraft, each with one person on an aircraft, and it's about 400 miles of travel. But the rest of the story is, of course, there's four people on all the other islands, and they want to get somewhere. And so you end up with this. <coughs> You've got 20 flights, one person on every plane, and about 2,000 miles of travel. Now, there's another way of doing this, another way of getting these people to these islands, and that is to elect one of the islands as a hub. So obviously, we're going to pick the one in the middle. That's now a hub airport. And we're going to fly people to the hub. They're all going to swap planes. And they're going to fly on to their, the destination they wanted. OK? With that model, we've got eight flights. Now, four people on a plane, much bigger planes. Four people on a plane, only 600 miles of travel. Those are the two examples. Four people on a plane, one person on a plane, 20 flights, eight flights. 2,000 miles, 600 miles. If you're an airline, which do you think would be the cheaper mode to operate? Which do you think would produce the cheaper ticket prices? Don't think I need to answer that, do I? Coming back to this one. If you elect, and the airlines would like you to elect, one of those islands as a hub, what's the advantage? Well, the advantage is cheap flights. What's the disadvantage? Well, if you live on the outside, you can't get anywhere directly. You've got the disadvantage of having to fly to the hub, faff around swapping planes, and then fly off somewhere else. Longer journey, more hassle. But here's the point. If you are the hub, you've got direct flights everywhere. And you've got the cheap ticket prices. And that's the issue. That's the issue about why it's important for us in London to have a hub. Because if we don't, we're going to have to end up flying somewhere to swap planes onto the plane that's going to take us to where we really wanted to get to in the first place. Travel, travel options. You don't have to travel by plane. So what are the other travel options? You can travel by road. OK, road is good, actually. Road is very good. It's good because as soon as you leave your front door, you're on your way, and you start traveling. It's not necessarily as fast as some of the other modes of transport, but it gets you from door to door. Pretty good. Rail. You could travel by normal speed rail, which I think they call classic rail, or you can travel by high speed rail. And they're slightly different. They've got the, the, the hassle factor of unless you actually live on the doorstep of a railway station, you've got to get to the railway station, so you've got a bit of a delay there. But once you get on the train, it's pretty quick, faster than driving your car. So why air? Well, this is a little graph, OK? I'm going to explain the graph. On the vertical axis is the number of hours you've been traveling. On the horizontal axis, starting here, this is London, 
200, 400, 600 miles. And this is roughly, you know, Manchester, Paris, Geneva, Milan, and Istanbul over there. So you've set off in your car, and immediately you're on your way. If you go by train, now I've said for, the, for this example here, we wasted an hour. Well, we spent an hour getting to the railway station. When we get on our train, the train is travelling faster than the car, and eventually it overtakes it. And according to the, the way I've drawn this, it looks like it overtakes it somewhere before you get to Manchester. What about a plane? Well, a plane, you've got all that faff, haven't you? You've got to get to the airport. It's going to take you an hour. You've got two hours of hanging around, drinking coffee. Get on the plane. Three hours into your journey, you've gone nowhere. But when you do start going, my goodness, you go fast. And so somewhere around Paris, you've overtaken the train. And thereafter, it really takes off. Excuse the pun. And so you've got these sort of different distances and different optimum modes of transport. Rail, high-speed rail, air. What does that look like on a map? It looks like that. If you forget the channel for a minute, the water's a bit of a nuisance, but, you know, rail, that's, you know, that's good for classic rail. That's good for high-speed rail. But really, if you get beyond that, you only have one convenient option of travel, and that's air. So we can, we can enhance our rail as much as we like. At some point, you're going to want to go by air, if you want to go any distance. But I hear you, planes are bad. The environment is important, I and mean, it, it is, it is very important. But I tell you this, from the moment we started travelling, from the moment we put a horse and cart through that wood, we were doing environmental damage, and it hasn't stopped. I'm going to talk about air pollution to start with, and these are very approximate figures, all right? And I've, I'm looking at CO2, I know there's NOx and there's particulates and so on, but CO2, very roughly speaking, fuel consumption of your mode of transport turns into carbon dioxide. So I'm going to say you've got a car, it's going to do 40 miles per gallon. If you're one person in that car, that's 40 miles per gallon per person. Two people in the car, it'll be 80, all right? But for this thing, 40. Okay, what, what does an aircraft do? What's the, what's the fuel consumption of an aircraft? It's actually quite difficult to find the figures. But an aircraft with a medium distance journey per passenger is about 80 miles per gallon. They're pretty damn efficient methods of travel. And that's one of the reasons your ticket prices are so cheap. If you're doing a short-haul flight, if you're flying from London up to Leeds, that's the equivalent of sitting in a traffic jam in your car in London. The, the, the fuel consumption goes up massively. There's a lot burnt on takeoff and, and landing and so on. But medium distance journey, a few thousand miles, that's, um, that's the sort of figures you're talking about. <coughs> rail? Rail, very efficient. No two ways about it. 160, I've seen figures twice that. Depends what sort of railway you're talking about and how far you're going and how often you're stopping, but it's very good. So, have a think. How many miles did you travel and what modes of transport did you use last year? So, here's mine. I did about 150 journeys in the car. Generally don't use the car during the week. Probably did, not really that many miles, probably about 4,000 miles in my car. Train, commute every day. That's probably about 15,000 miles on the train, but it's in a good mode of transport, isn't it? Aeroplane. Only did six journeys on an aeroplane last year. That's good, isn't it? I kept my, kept my air miles. Well, no, actually, I didn't. I only did six journeys. But in those six journeys, I did almost the same number of miles as I did in 560 railway journeys. So I'm putting it to you that the mode of transport isn't the issue, whether it's car or it's plane or it's train. The real issue is how many miles we travel. 
And the thing is that when we get on planes, we tend to travel an awful long way. And I just want to remind you that most of the travel is leisure travel. It's your fault. It's my fault. All right? It's not somebody else's fault. Carving up the countryside. I'll just mention this in passing. Railway's good. Airport's bad. Twin-track railway, like HS1, carves 30 metres out of the countryside, going through it roughly, through the countryside. Big motorway, it's about 40 metres. Even worse when you look at a runway. Runway, 50 metres, 50 metres wide. Of course, the difference is that a runway is only three kilometres long. Your railway, your road, is all the way there. And that's not insignificant. That's a lot of, lot of land that we're carving up. So I'm sick and tired of railway people telling me, oh, it's really green. Uh, mm, yes, it is in some senses, but not in others. And of course, the other thing is you've got to maintain all of that, which is why rail travel isn't as cheap as you think it might be, because you've got thousands of miles of railway to not 300 meet, um, three kilometers of, uh, of runway. But anyway, there's just some, just some thoughts there. So, we talked about some of, the, some of the background to this. What are the options? What are the options for this southeast debate? Option number one, and we don't talk about it much because the people who are pushing airports don't really want you to talk about it, but I'm gonna talk about it. Do nothing. It is an option. If we did nothing, you'd still be able to get to anywhere in the world from the UK. You might not be able to travel when you want to travel, what time you want to travel. You may not be able to travel from the airport you want to travel. You may have to go up to somewhere else and, and travel out of there. But you would be able to get out of the UK to somewhere Climb on a big aircraft and fly to where you wanted to go to. All right, so do nothing is, a, is an opportunity. We will still be able to travel the world. You could increase ticket prices. <coughs> Those of you who are old enough, like me, will remember that when you were kids, ticket prices were very, very expensive. It was only rich people that went on airplanes. If we did that, you could cut out all the backpackers. Well, an awful lot of us, actually, wouldn't fly anymore. It'd be just like the old days. Then we'd have loads of airport capacity. We've got runways, we have loads, we'd just get rid of the passengers. All right, that's, that's, easy. that's a you know, genuine solution. Stop issuing visas. If the world stopped allowing you to fly there and we stopped allowing people to fly here, we'd solve the problem. Again, all this leisure stuff, what's it all about? Is that what we want? Is that what you want? Because this, this, I keep coming back to it. These airports, these planes are for you. Do you want to stop? The right to travel. Is it a luxury? This is something that really came to me. It's really the freedom to travel. We, we, we kind of treat that as, a, as, a, as a, a right. Is it a right or is it a luxury? I work with, um, work with a Russian lady who came out of Russia um, before the Iron Curtain came down. So she knew Russia in the old days. And she's been living in this country for a long time. And I said to Ludmilla, what was it like coming out of Russia and coming into the UK, supermarkets, loads of everything? It must be fantastic. And she said, the thing that really struck me was not the supermarkets, the thing that really struck me was the travel agents. That's a concept we didn't have in Russia. We weren't allowed to travel. You had to, you had to get permission to travel. And that really did make me question. We just take it as, you know, we're climbing a plane, we go wherever. But is that, is that, should we treat that as a luxury? Should we curb that? Ludmilla certainly thought it was the most outstanding thing of her move to the UK. So there we have it. Um, the world is out there for us. Do we want to restrict it? Is it good to restrict, artificially restrict travel? Because if it is, and I've given you a number of reasons why it might be, 
then let's make a positive decision that that's what we're going to do. All right, rather than just put it in the too difficult pile. It is an option. But if we're not going to do that, we need to face up to our transport issue of lack of runway capacity. Which brings us to the Southeast Airports and the debate. There are four major runners for the um, expansion. And I'm just going to canter through them and give you some of my personal views on the pros and cons. First one is Thames Estuary, Boris Island. It looks wonderful. And frankly, if we could have an airport like that, it would be one of a modern airport, fantastic facilities, brilliant. Geographically, it's not quite in the right place, maybe, for serving UK, but nonetheless, a fantastic facility. But, and there's always a but. Um, oh, you were probably going to think, yeah, but technically it's quite difficult. Do you know, I think all the technical problems we could overcome. We've done it before, we'll do it again. But for me, the real issue is this. Boris keeps quoting Hong Kong Airport. This is uh, Cheplak Kok Airport in Hong Kong. And he says, Hong Kong did it, so can we. Now, I know we did it. I was out there. That is a man-made island. We filled the sea in, we made that. It's enormous. And we built a terminal on it, and we built two runways. And we put beautiful rail connections in and road connections that go all the way right into Hong Kong. It's a fabulous airport. You step out of the front of the airport, there's the, there's the train. You step onto the train, great train, fast train, cheap. It's a great airport, huge success. What Boris doesn't tell you is that that airport was built at the end of the British rule in Hong Kong. And it was a Hong Kong government that had an immense amount of money. And they were going to spend that money before the keys got handed over to China in 1997. <laughs> the whole world knew that, and the whole world descended on Hong Kong, and they built that. That was not privately funded. Boris likes to tell you that the estuary terminal would be Estuary Airport will be privately funded. That was publicly funded. And the other key thing he doesn't tell you is that the old airport, Kai Tak Airport, was also owned by the government. And the government could close that airport overnight, which it did, and it moved the entire operation, all of the air blinds, everything, into Cheplak Kok. And the following day, it started up in Cheplak Kok. It was a bit of a disaster for about two weeks, but it turned into one of the most successful airports in the world. Two vital facts. The government paid for it, and the government owned the other airport, and so they could move everything overnight. Just before we leave this slide, there's another thing of interest here. Top left-hand corner, you see a load of buildings there? That's, those buildings stretch all the way down Lantau Island. If you go on to... Um, uh, Google Earth, look at it. Big sort of city right down there. That's Lantau Island and eventually Hong Kong Island off the left-hand side of the slide. The important thing is that when we built this airport back in the, uh, the early 90s, Lantau Island looked like the rest of it there, absolutely deserted. And this is what happens when you build an airport. As soon as you build an airport, the city comes and grabs it. So wherever you build an airport, Give it 30 years, there is a city around it. Okay, just a point I'm making. I'm going to move on. Stansted and Gatwick, I'm going to lump these two together because for me, they both offered an opportunity. Not an opportunity that was taken up, incidentally. Stansted didn't really join a debate. They kind of said, well, you could, but they didn't really go for it. Gatwick, very aggressive campaign. <coughs> run like many political campaigns, I'm afraid. Um, basically, we're the right solution because they're the wrong solution. All right. Destroy the opposition, and that must mean that you're the right one. Well, I thought that one of these uh, other airports was going to say, 
we will build another hub. So we have a two-hub London. Gatwick haven't done that. Gatwick have said, well, we'll just build another railway and we'll carry on as we are, pretty much. Um, a lot of my colleagues in Arab disagree with this view, but it's, it's mine. I think we could have a two-hub London, um, but there's, a, there's some catches to it. Um, Heathrow was a very successful hub at 65 million passengers per year. It's operating above that at the moment. And if you look at those graph lines, it's not long before we get to overall requirement of not 60, but 120, 130 million passengers a year. So why couldn't you have two 65 million <coughs> passenger hubs working efficiently? I think it could be done, and I'm going to use a city analogy here. This is Canary Wharf. Back in the 80s, that was a windswept Dockland. And they started building that big tower, Canary Wharf Tower. And everybody thought they were bonkers. What are they doing? Building a big tower out in the middle of nowhere. But look at it. Whatever it is, 30 years later, it's a huge success, a massive success. It's another business hub. Who would have thought 30 years ago you could have two business hubs? You have the City of London, you can have Canary Wharf. But they did it. But also, you've got to remember, that despite all of the um, tax incentives and so on to, to, to develop this area, there were, Olympia and York went bust over achieving it. Because it's not just about building the infrastructure, not just build about, about the buildings. You've got to get people to move in. And that's expensive, because you've got to get big companies to, to You've got to buy their leases out. You've got to give them incredibly low rent deals to get them to move in. Once you've got them to move in and it's generated its own momentum, eventually it becomes its self-sustaining hub. But that's a very expensive part of it. Building the infrastructure is not enough. And that would apply to Stansted or Gatwick. Building the infrastructure is not enough. You need a large number of the airlines to move to. And that is very expensive to buy them out and get them to move. So finally, we come to Heathrow. Hub airport already. The airlines are all in favour of this. Business is in favour of it. Local people are in, in favour. Of course they're in favour of it. Loads and loads of jobs. But what about you? What does it mean for you? It's not a free lunch. None of these options are perfect options, okay? What do I mean for, for Heathrow? Well, the airlines love it, which means the, the ticket prices would be good. More flights, more convenience, cheaper travel. Downside, it's in quite a crowded area, so there's bound to be more pollution. It's interesting, actually, it's all over the newspapers at the moment, you know, the pollution levels at Heathrow are already high. What's it going to be if you put... Do you know, if you got rid of the M25, the pollution would be fine. But that's the thing, isn't it? It's us, in our cars. We need to get to the airport, we drive there. M25 is chucking out NOx and other fumes and so on. And of course, you put an airport near a mo motorway, which you need to do, it's only going to make it worse. We know it's good for business. Of course it is. What transport infrastructure doesn't have business support? But really, the issue is, and we come back to this business of the politicians, Politicians will do whatever they think will get them votes. What would you like? You, personally. These aeroplanes are for you. What do you want? I'd like to leave you with a final thought. Back in the 50s, we had no motorways. You could get anywhere in the UK on A roads, B roads, C roads. Anywhere in the UK you could get. But we went ahead and we built motorways. And that wasn't a free lunch either. That brought environmental damage, noise, pollution, the whole lot. But it also made travel very much more convenient. And more recently, the M25. We built the M25. That wasn't so long ago. And all the same issues came up. But having got the M25, would you close it tomorrow? 
having seen the benefits, could you imagine London without an M25 now? Because I think the airport debate falls into that category. It's not without its downsides, but I think if we look back in years to come, we think, how do we ever do without it? And just for the record, I am in favour of expansion and I would choose Heathrow. Thank you very much. Right, I hope that's given some, some uh, food for thought. I'm sure there's some very strong opinions in the room. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions or indeed make any statements? Excellent presentation, thank you. Um, just one question really. You didn't mention increasing aircraft size. So I guess the capacity issue comes to the availability of slots at airports. So you build another runway, you have more slots. Why not just have much larger aircraft? Um, there comes a point at which you can, you can just keep making aircraft larger and larger. But again, it comes down to, you take a, an A380 a aircraft, you know, over 400 seats. If you can fill those 400, then that's great. You, you do that. And in, in, indeed, the aircraft sizes have gone up considerably. But when, you, when you've got your feeder islands to your, your hub, you need to have an appropriate size aircraft, and, and it is all about feeding into that hub. Uh, so it's not just about making aircraft larger and larger. Um, appropriate size aircraft with appropriate feeds. Um, yeah, that's what I think is, is the answer. Hi, Richard. Excellent, excellent talk. Very thought-provoking. Um, I think if we were to go down, if the government were to make a decision that back the recommendation from the data Commission and select Heathrow as being the option to go forward with. Do you not think that there would be more local people who would be proponents if the technology was able to do something about the noise? Yeah, you mentioned about it being a car issue as much as it is, it's probably more than it is a plane issue. But it's the noise issue yeah. for the residents. Okay, I, th I think the noise is the big issue, frankly, because um, it affects everybody. There are two things I want to, want to say there. One is, um, the, the noise on aircraft, it's getting better. There's an awful lot of research going into to aircraft noise. Uh, and the interesting thing I, I heard was that it's not about the engines making noise, particularly when you come in low. You, you, tend, to, you tend to take off from an, an airport and do a very steep climb. So there's quite a bit of noise as you, you climb out, but then it's fine. The, Probably more people are affected by the, the land, which is a, which is a much slower um, run into the, the airport, much um, flatter run into the airport. Um, and one of the things I heard was, it's not about the engines. It's about the noise of the wind on the airframe. I go, seriously? Do you know, there's a really good experiment you can do. You know these, um, you, know, you know in toilets now, you have the, uh, the, the hot jet air thing, those air blades and so on, the very high speed air drives. Really interesting. You get one of those going, put your hand in it, it's really noisy. Take your hand out and it's really quite quiet. And that's a kind of an, an analogy. That's high speed air running over your hands and making this noise. And that's exactly what's happening with air, aircraft. And so I think there's an awful lot of research going into how do you make um, undercarriages more aer aerodynamic? How do you stop uh, the A320 aircraft whistling as it does on a approach? And, and <coughs> Airbus have come up with a, a solution to that. Um, so we've got that, that, that side of the, the, the noise debate, which I think is, uh, is very interesting. We've done a lot of research here. We've got, um, we've got a facility here, um, which is Sound Lab. It's basically an anechoic chamber with a big, very sophisticated three-dimensional sound system in it. It was built to replicate the acoustics of various concert theatres, so you can tailor your concert theatre to the, the um, uh, reverberation, the sound you want. But equally, it's now been used for simulating the noise of HS2 in various locations. So you get background noise and you get the noise of, of the um, train coming through. And more recently, it's been used to do exactly the same thing for aircraft noise. Different types of aircraft, different approach um, patterns. Um, 
And what I found really interesting is that noise is an issue, but we've had, we've had Heathrow, we've had all of the um, politicians in here, we've had a lot of the protest groups in here to listen to the different scenarios. And where, when the debate started on this, it was Heathrow was saying that that was not an issue or that is an issue, and the protest groups were saying something else, and they were all over the place, they, what was going to be the problem and so on. And what, what those simulations have done is bring everybody together. So they're pretty much all in agreement of these, these are not issues. We thought they were. They're not issues. These are the issues here. And I think the, the other, other point I just want to finish on is the thing that Howard Davis recommended, which was stopping early morning flights. Uh, for anybody living in London, having a, uh, an aircraft coming over your home at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning is, is not great. Um, why don't we just stop that? That's what Davis said. And I challenged Heathrow on that. I said, you know, if there's one thing you could do that would make a real difference to people's perception of noise is get rid of the early morning flights. Now, for some reason, I think there's 14 flights before 6 o'clock, all right? So a few at 5 and then a few more at 5.30, generally from the, the Far East. Why don't you just get rid of them? Stop them. And the point that was made to me, and I'm surprised it hasn't been made more, more openly, is that Heathrow doesn't have the right to stop them. They don't own those slots. Those slots are owned by the airlines. It would be for the government to stop that. Uh, and I think that's what the government should do. I mean, the airlines aren't going to like it because they're flying in from, from uh, Hong Kong or whatever, and then they can, passengers connecting and flying on to the States or, or wherever. Um, but that's, that for me, that there are little things like that that could be done that make an awful lot of difference. But I don't think it's in the power of the airports to do it because of this dispersed ownership of these facilities. Thank you. Um, really very interesting presentation, very informative. Um, of all these arguments that are going on for Heathrow, and obviously your support for Heathrow, in the wider discussion, were any northern airports actually considered for expansion? Yes, um, probably the closest um, to, to home was, was uh, Bir Birmingham. Um, Birmingham has a few problems itself, but would like, like to expand. Um, the, some of the issues with, with the northern airports, uh, again, the great connectivity, but it's actually away from the centre of gravity of most of the air travel. And it's one of the points that um, Harry Bush made, he's the ex -reg airport regulator, he said that where you've got existing airports with existing capacity, you have to ask yourself, why aren't the airlines starting up new routes? Because the airlines will chase after any, any money they can. Um, and that's, that's, again, one of the issues about Heathrow, that the airlines love running from Heathrow because they can fill all the seats. There are one or two big international flights out of Birmingham and as well, well as, as Manchester. But they, are, they tend to be only once or twice a day um, because you can't fill the aircraft yet. Be a bit like the Stansted and Gatwick. I think if you, if you manage to create that critical mass, then you could create a hub airport out there, a big hub airport. Um, but it requires a huge shift of airlines, a whole operation up there. Um, and that getting over that initial critical um, startup point, I think, is is the challenge. I think Richard made some excellent points. First of all, um, aviation underpins modern society. We all travel; business depends on it. In the UK, um, we import a lot of goods using aviation, so it is a really important part of our economy. Um, we need to expand to address the growth issue. Uh, and it does make sense, I agree with Richard, that we should be focusing on existing um, airports like Heathrow, which already have good connections, um, and, and, and building on that. So I think, um, yeah, I, I agree with what he was saying. I think Heathrow is a good option for expansion. Yeah, and the, the other point, um, we can basically build larger aircraft. Uh, the manufacturers are making the aircraft more efficient and less noisy, that's important, and I think those are issues that are going to become less of a problem 
for people living around airports because the aircraft are going to get quieter. They're going to produce less um, pollution. So I think we should not be afraid of expanding air travel. It's a very efficient way of moving people and goods around. Yeah, Alvar, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. I think it's a very difficult subject, so I think it did exceptionally well. It's obviously very controversial. Um, someone like myself, we had a company flat in Mortlake, so I understand what it's like living under the flight path of Heathrow. Uh, but by the same token, our capacity is at a limit, so we have to make a decision. I actually live in Shropshire, in a very picturesque part of the world. Uh, we have a very small airport that's only a mile from my home, uh, that's used for training flights and light aircraft. Uh, Twelve years ago, they wanted to turn that into a low-cost airport. And I was, part, I was chairman of the action group which fought it to stop them turning it into a cheap uh, jet airport. And we successfully uh, managed to stop that happening. So I do understand the protest uh, side of it all. Um, my view on Heathrow and the decision, uh, the recommendation is that Heathrow's in the wrong place, but it's too late. And we had a chance in, those of us who are a little bit older, uh, with Maplin Sands, which Richard mentioned in the late 60s, early 70s. That was, the, that was the chance to actually develop a new airport in the estuary. That opportunity is gone. And unfortunately, I think it can only be Heathrow.